You ever heard about that? Cholesterol is essential for life. If we don't have cholesterol, we're dead. It's that simple. That's why your body makes it. You see, the cholesterol holds every 75 trillion cells in our body together. It's gooey and material. That's its job. However, since our liver makes it, what do I have to tell you? We don't require dietary cholesterol. You see that? Because what is it? It's gooey stuff. Do you think you need extra gooey stuff in your arteries and veins? So therefore, you do not require cholesterol in your diet because your liver is going to make all it needs. Before we move on, your liver is located underneath your 12th rib. Here is my sexist remark of the video, I should say, or the lecture. Um, women have 12 ribs. Men have 11. So whenever you guys want to give it back, it's okay by me. You see? That's how it works. And why they say that the woman has one extra rib is the scientific community says that women still deliver babies. You see that? Science hasn't caught up with that part yet. Thank God for that. But you women still do that. And therefore, it's called a floating rib, and it protects the abdominal cavity. So that's some anatomical difference that is not readily observed, obviously, between men and women. You need to understand that. But it is located underneath the 12th rib. What's my point? The point is this. Many times when I give an examination, and you've done this before, you've seen how they tap on your stomachs and things like that, we're trying to find out borders. We want to see what's going on. And we know the liver's supposed to be located here. However, in someone with, let's say, a chronic alcoholic, let's say, I won't find their liver border here. I will find it here. And the reason I'll find it here is, is the liver is working overtime. Is alcohol toxic to the system? It is. Who's the major detoxifier of the body? The liver. Who are you wiping out? your liver, the one that's performing 700 functions a day for you. And I need to explain another thing to you. When we were in Mama, that's where we all came from, correct? Who was making blood for us at the time was Mom, obviously, but your liver and your spleen were. When you come out in the real world and they spank us on the butt, things change, don't they? And all of a sudden, they really do. The liver stops making blood. Your long bones make blood for you today our femurs, our pelvis, our sternum, our spine, and our cranium make blood for us today. However, if we were to develop some sort of a health challenge in our adult life, and our, and our bones could not make blood for us, guess who reconverts? Your liver reconverts in adult life and starts making blood for you again. Please understand this. Please understand when you eat things or you do things or hurt yourselves that you're hurting your liver, and your liver you need, okay? Now, with respect to digestion, what's it do for us? It produces a thing called bile. Bile's job is to go down and break fats. We call it emulsification of fats. It's a soapiness of fats. That's what its job is to do. And when it gets stored, it gets stored in the gallbladder. I'm depicting a picture now showing you of the gallbladder. The gallbladder's job is to concentrate the bile 10 to 12 times of normal. It's a sac. And it's going to do that. And when you eat a meal, you obviously have fat in your meal because fat is required in, you know, throughout the American. You need to have fat in your diet, some fat, not a lot, but you need to have it. And its job is to break it down. Okay, that's the gallbladder's job. Now, people have talked about what about gallstones? Where do they come from? What are they made from? Here's what it is. They have done research on people with chronic high-fat diets. And chronic high-fat diets produce a lot of bile, Correct. Cholesterol comes from the liver, too, but it comes for a ride, and it precipitates and becomes a stone. Therefore, that's a problem for us. I like to say, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but you can see at the Optimum Health Institute, there's not a lot of fat in your food, right? So you won't have this problem of producing gallstones because there won't be a lot of high-fat diet. You need to understand, that can happen with a chronic high-fat diet. You'll get gallstones. I want to mention to you why this is a problem. If a gallstone gets lodged in what we call the common bile duct, it blocks the bile going into the small intestine. It gets backed up into the liver and becomes very, very toxic. It becomes a medical emergency. It's very, very important to understand that. You see? And now, would you have this problem with a raw food diet? Absolutely not. See, the body's not designed to have chronic high-fat diet. You need to understand that. Remember when I talked about that you're held accountable for your body, what you put down your body? Yeah, maybe today it didn't do any damage for you, but over the long haul, it's a way of life, you have to understand, that you're trying to make a change in. It's a way of life how you eat your food. It's very important. Okay. All right. Now, I know I've mentioned a lot of things today. And before we move on, I want to review a little bit. Before we move into the small intestine, I want to review a little bit so you can get an idea of what we talked about and take you up to speed. Now, 
Where does digestion begin? In the brain. Specifically where? In the hypothalamus. How many times we chew our food? 20 or 30 times. There's an enzyme squirted out called what? Tylen, and it breaks down starch. Down the stomach we go, right? We gotta be calm, down the stomach we go, and in there we get produced hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Hydrochloric acid, very important for the breakdown of food. Intrinsic factor, very important for the binding of B12. B12 is very important for the maturation of red blood cells. I like to say the pancreas gets into the game, and it produces chymotrypsin and trypsin for the breakdown of protein. Amylase for the breakdown of starch. Lipase for the breakdown of fat. And a sodium bicarbonate ion that attaches to the hydrogen ion from the hydrochloric acid. I like to mention that the liver gets into the game. The liver produces bile, it gets stored in the gallbladder, it gets concentrated 10 to 12 times, and it's important for the emulsification of fat, the breakdown of fat. Okay, so that's basically what we've talked about up to this point. However, there's one more step that's very, very important. When we eat our food, it becomes a thing called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. It's a white, chalky paste material and that, no matter what you eat, that's what it ends up looking like. And that's what's going to go down into the small intestine. However, what did I mention earlier? I said the body requires acid to break things down. The body does not like acid when it comes to absorption. Understand this concept. So glands, we have some glands right at the very front part of the small intestine called Bruner's glands. That's how I say in science, I want to back up. If you find a body part that no one else has found, it's yours and it's everybody's body. That's how it works. So Bruner found these glands. They're in everybody's bodies for the rest of our lives. And what do they do? They squirt out a bunch of mucus. All right. So the mucus that they, put, they squirt out will change the pH. We talked about pH to a 5.38 level. When that happens, it shuts down the cells that are producing the hydrochloric acid the breakdown of the food, and calms everything down and coats the small intestine. The point is this. We need to be calm when we chew our meals because the nervous system controls everything we do. And when it comes to eating our meal, the calm side, the parasympathetic side, takes over in the glands. The example I like to use is when you're really stressed out, you get a dry mouth, don't you? Because you're not, the blood's not going to be here. It's going to be out here. You see? But when you're eating, you've got to be calm, collected, relaxed, and therefore the glands work. The point is this. I like to use it this way. If you're running the marathon, like, I'm hurrying, I've got to go, I've got to go, I've got to eat things, I've got to do this and that. Where is the blood? It's out here. It's not here. And therefore, that's the sympathetic side. The parasympathetic side tells us to slow down. When you eat your meal, you need to slow down. The Bruner glands are working. They're helping you. So what happens if you're running the marathon? I'm late to work. I got to go. I got to do this. I got to do that. And you're eating your meal. Bruner gland doesn't work. Who's going to help you when all that acid from your stomach is going to go into the small intestine? Nobody. Guess what? 50% of all ulcers are duodenal. First part of the small intestine. 50%. Run the marathon, and that's what happens. You need to be calm, you need to be quiet, you need to be in a good state of mind, and these things won't happen to you. That's how the body's designed to work. Okay? All right. Your small intestine. Here it is. As you noticed, we still haven't absorbed a thing. You're literally starving as you sit there, I know, and that's how it goes. But here we are. The small intestine, 90% of absorption occurs here. This is where the body feeds itself. I want you to understand something, that the human body is the most efficient thing known to man. There is no waste when it comes to the human body. It does not mess around. So therefore, 90% of absorption will occur here. This is a picture depicting a little piece of the small intestine. What the small intestine needed to do is think about surface area. We only have so much real estate, I like to think about, and this is where we have to be more efficient. This is where we have to take it all in. So it has millions of microvilli. The example I want to use is if we were to cut out one square inch of the small intestine and you spread it out, the surface area would be as large as a desk. If you take the small intestine and you spread it out, the surface area becomes as large as a tennis court. So if you can imagine, this white kind, chalky paste material is being leaked 
over a tennis court and the body's absorbing it all. That's what its job is to do. Now, I mentioned the microvilli and the surface area. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to walk on over to my whiteboard and I'm going to show you what I mean. These are the microvilli that I'm drawing. You have millions of them. Now, if we were to take this and spread it out, it would be a string that long. Everybody follow me with that? Is everybody okay? Now, what did I mention earlier on in the lecture? That the esophagus's job, when it came to peristaltic movements, the food would move straight through. Not so in the small intestine and large intestine. How it moves in the small intestine and large intestine is like this. If the food came straight through, this side would touch it. This side would touch it. However, nothing would get in the middle. That is inefficient. When the food comes through the small intestine and large intestine, it comes in corkscrew like this. I want you to think of it this way. Corkscrew. The analogy I like to use is I want you to think of it as your washer machine. Agitation. The body wants it all. There is no waste at this time. It's going to suck it all up. But we need to discuss another thing. Let's say you were a bad guy, what we call a foreign body, a bacteria, a virus. And I munched you 20 or 30 times, and I acid washed you. You got by my tonsils. You did everything. I'm waiting for you right here. That's called a lacteal duct. It's part of the lymphatic system. So, in reiterating that the lymphatic system is very important in the digestive tract, is that it works with protecting the body. It did it in the, small, in the, in the tonsils, and it's now it's doing it in the small intestine from the lacteal ducts. When we get into the large intestine, there'll be another spot. We'll speak about that in a moment. So to reiterate what happens in the small intestine, 90% absorption occurs here. The food comes in corkscrew different than it does in the, in the esophagus. And we have the lacteal ducts, part of the lymphatic system, to protect us. Moving right along. I like to think of it as the part that you're actively involved in, the large intestine, your colon. Now I'm showing you a picture of the colon. There's the ileocecal valve, where it separates the small intestine from the large intestine. It is a one-way valve. The picture showing a little squiggly thing coming off the side there, and that is the appendix. Now, people have asked, what's the appendix for? It's part of the lymphatic system. Now, let's think about this. Let's go back. We're going to eat our meal. We have the tonsils to protect us. We're about to absorb our meal. We have the lacteal ducts. We're about to go into another chamber, into the large intestine. You have the appendix. The body has gone out of its way with the lymphatic system to make sure that no foreign bodies enter the bloodstream. Interesting concept. That's what it's done. It makes sense. The next part is the ascending colon. Next part is the transverse colon. The next part would be called the descending colon. And then, of course, the rectum out the door. Um, the picture also shows you where it bends, called the hepatic flexure, where it bends. And also over on this side, called the splenic flexure, bends over by the spleen. Now, the large intestine is very, very important. I had mentioned earlier that 10% of absorption will occur in the, in the large intestine, but mostly water. However, there's some very important vitamins and things that occur in the, in the large intestine we need to discuss. Vitamin K gets produced in the large intestine. A lot of us haven't heard of vitamin K. Vitamin K is very, very important. Vitamin K's job is for the coagulation of blood. In other words, without vitamin K, a little cut, you could bleed to death. That's why our body makes vitamin K. Some of the confusing nomenclature that's out there is that vitamin K is considered a non-essential vitamin. This can be confusing because something like vitamin C is considered an essential vitamin. Let me explain what this means. Non-essential means that your body makes that vitamin. Essential means you need to get it through your diet, like vitamin C. Doesn't mean they're not important, it means that your body makes them. In fact, it's so important that it makes vitamin K. It doesn't rely on our, on our diet to get it. Who makes vitamin K? It's the byproduct from our bacteria, our natural bacteria in our colon. Their byproduct makes vitamin K. If, for whatever reason, you had a raging infection, whatever it is, 
and you need to take some sort of antibiotic therapy. We know that antibiotics kill good bacteria and bad bacteria. And I just told you that the good bacteria in our body make vitamin K. So therefore, we would lose vitamin K production. Can we get then dietary vitamin K? We can through our leafy greens. Leafy greens, broccoli, spinach, par parsley, all have a lot of vitamin K in them, and they will help you with that scenario. In moving right along with that, why do we give you the Rejuvelac at the Institute? That is a natural acidophilus. It'll help produce the um, normal bacteria, will therefore help produce the vitamin K. We know when you're doing implants and enemas that you're cleansing the colon. You see, when you flush the colon, you're getting good and bad bacteria going out the door too. The next thing we're going to talk about is a high fiber diet, research says, can help prevent the cause of colon cancer. There's a lot of research that's come up with that. It's very well published. No big deal. Let me explain why. How do we say that the, that the peristaltic movements work in the large intestine and small intestine? They come in corkscrew. High fiber, a lot of bulk is going to do what? It's going to clean out the large intestine. It's going to clean out the small intestine. I like to leave you a thought. Does a high raw food diet give you a lot of fiber? Absolutely. It does help us with this sort of thing. Keep this in mind. When you think about longevity, when you think about health, these are some of the things that you do to help yourself. That would be the thing to do that. Okay? The next thing that's very important that we like to speak about at the Institute is answering the call. In other words, when you need to go to the restroom, you need to go to the restroom. And I like to use myself as an example. If I'm here teaching this class today, and my body said to me, Andy, it's time for you to go to the bathroom, I'm going to say, well, it's not convenient right now. I can't go to the bathroom, so I'm going to wait till after the class. Is that correct? But what happens? The sensation goes away. The next day, I might be sitting on the golf course, hole number four, oh, time to go to the bathroom again. Again, not convenient unless I'm going to use the tree, and therefore, I have to wait till after the game. After the game, sensation's gone, therefore, I don't go to the restroom. The next day, I might be at the movies, you paid $7.50 to get in, best part's coming up, boop, time to go to the bathroom again. What happens? You don't go. You wait till after the movie. After the movie, sensation's gone. What is happening? This is what's going on. You have sensory fibers throughout the body. If someone's pinching you, you know that. Your colon, your intestinal tract, everywhere has sensory fibers. When it expands a little bit and it's full, it sends a message to the brain. The brain says time to eliminate. You think that conscious mind knows more than subconscious mind. Remember, there are 700 functions going on in your liver and you don't even know diddly what's going on. And it's not up to you to decide what is happening. You do not decide about the heartbeats, respiration, everything else. So you should not decide when you think it's comfortable to go to the restroom. Society will decide, obviously, but your body's telling you something. And this is another big step in healthcare. When your body begins to speak to you, when you become more in tune with your body, you will be healthier. Because when your body tells you something, you'll listen to it. Don't ignore it. And you, all of a sudden, you become more in tune with your body. Same thing with answering the call. When you need to eliminate, you need to eliminate. And I like to use the word this. It's not time for it to cultivate in your colon. It's time to eliminate. The longer it stays in your colon, it is dying. The raw food, the live food that you ate is now dying in your colon. Rigor mortis is going on. You're absorbing all the impurities that your body meant to eliminate. You're taking it on. So please, pay attention to that. It is important. So when you have to eliminate, do eliminate. Now, the megacolon syndrome. Let's back up just one second. What were you doing to your body when I said, I can't go today because I'm teaching my class, I can't go tomorrow because I'm golfing, can't go tomorrow when I'm going to the movies? What's happening? You're saying, body, please don't bother me when you're this big. Bother me when you're this big. That's a problem. That's a problem. Pay attention to that, and you won't have that problem. What I'd like to do at this time is go back and review everything we just talked about today. Because I know I've said a lot, I know it's a lot of information, but we're going to touch on it one more time. And we're going to take it from top to bottom. Okay. Where does digestion begin? In the brain, in the hypothalamus. How many times we chew our food? 20 or 30 times. We have a gland called the parotid gland. It squirts out an enzyme to help break down starch in our mouths. Down the esophagus we go into our stomach. We have auxinic cells that produce